Welcome to Everything Co-op, bringing you information on how cooperatives can help improve your quality of life. This show is being sponsored by the National Co-op Bank, NCB. The NCB is dedicated to strengthening communities nationwide for the delivery of banking and financial services for the nation's cooperatives, their members, and other socially responsible organizations. For more information on the power of community ownership, visit ncb.coop. That's ncb.coop. Now stay tuned for your host, Vernon Oaks. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Everything Cooperative. This is a beautiful Thursday morning. We are glad to be on the show with you, and we're absolutely excited that Gina Schaefer is on with her. Good morning, Gina. Good morning. How are you? I am excellent. How are you doing today? I'm good, thanks. I do have a headset on. Can you just tell me if you can hear me okay? I hear you fine. So I can hear you. Now my question is, what do you want to tell the audience out there about uh <laughs> A lady that looks like a cheerleader who runs hardware stores, 11 of them, eight hardware stores in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. Well, I think anybody can do it. What do I want to talk about? Well, Vernon, I had an interesting conversation yesterday with a gentleman who actually ran into a Ace hardware friend of mine in Colorado. And he called me because he was leaving the tech industry, had experience in Google and some other big tech businesses and didn't know anything about co-op. And I think that feels like something I run into all the time, um, how unknown co-ops are and how much the word needs to be spread. And so I'm you know, constantly with my team trying to figure out what we can do to talk more about co-ops and get the word out. I don't know, maybe you have some magic ideas. Well, the, the one magic idea we're living right now, and that is to get on radio and tell people about the benefits of co-ops. And this is why Chuck Snyder and the National Co-op Bank folks are sponsoring this program, is that there's a huge void that people just don't know about co-ops. Uh, there is. And there's such a wide variety of co-ops. For example, I was talking when I was talking to this gentleman yesterday, we talked about purchasing co-ops like ACE and CCA Global, for example, with the Carpet One Flooring and Home Stores. And then there are co-ops like REI, which are for consumers or grocery co-ops for the, the shoppers who go there. And um, there's such a rich breadth of opportunity for consumers and and community members to get involved in a co-op, but uh, it, we we just don't know about them. Okay, let me tell you tell the folks out there the four types because you brought it up. You talked about two of them, but there's two more okay. and major major types. And I think of worker co-ops, which could be any kind of business you can think of if it's owned and controlled yes. by the employees. It's a worker cooperative. And so any business that's out there in the world could be a worker cooperative. And then you have the second one is a consumer cooperative, and that's when the business is owned and controlled by the people that buy the products or the services. And you mentioned REI, uh, credit unions are an example. So housing co-ops are examples of those. Uh, the consumers own the business. And then I think of farmers will come together and they create purchasing co-ops. ACE is an example of purchasing co-ops. In D.C., there's something called Community Purchasing Alliance, which is go by CPA, which is a purchasing co-op for churches and nonprofits like charter schools and any other nonprofit. They have them even buying trash. Folks were getting ripped off with trash bills and yep. uh, electricity and solar power and copier machines. Anything that a group of people can get come together and buy together then they can get a lower price. And this is why co-ops make such a great, great example. And then farmers on the other side of that have marketing co-ops. And that's when they sell their products. So they come together and they produce whatever they're producing. And then they need somewhere to market it. And that is... What do you call them? Cabot Creamery? Oh, um, Cabot and Ocean Spray and Land Lake. Those are all great examples of marketing co-ops. So those are the four basic types, worker co-ops, consumer co-ops, purchasing co-ops, and marketing co-ops. And then you have, we talk about food, you mentioned food co-ops as a consumer cooperative that the people that buy in that grocery store own it, but it also could be a worker cooperative that the employees may own. And there, I see both of those, and sometimes they're hybrids. Uh, I've seen some food co-ops that are owned by the consumer and the employees. So, yeah. And we can talk about the benefits of them, and which is what I want to talk to you about today, 
was what are the benefits of co-ops? But before we do that, how did you get involved in hardware stores? Well, I um, I lived in, this was, I guess, the late 90s. I was living in a neighborhood called Logan Circle in Washington, D.C., and Logan Circle was undergoing a lot of changes. It had been, unfortunately, affected by the riots in the late 60s and had spent a lot of time really kind of going downhill, a lot of prostitution and drug dealers and boarded up houses. And in the late 90s, we could start to feel uh, people coming back, beautiful old houses that were being renovated. And I was getting laid off from my tech job. I was in the tech industry and I was tired of it. I wanted to own my own business. And I came home one day and I said, well, the neighborhood needs a hardware store. Why can't it be me? Okay. So that's what happened. So you got laid off. And I did. That gave you the opportunity. You looked yes. around and you saw there's a need. And so that need was. So if you bought in Logan Circle in the 90s, you, you're a millionaire just by your house. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to tell you, I had uh, I owned a condo and I, my first loan was with the SBA, the Small Business Administration. And uh, it was a, a bit of a requirement to over collateralize. And so I sold that condo. Uh, to pay for the proceeds of that first loan. So the neighborhood provided for me uh, very nicely to help kickstart the business um, in those first couple of years. So, yes. So you went to the Small Business Administration to get a loan to start your first Ace Hardware store. I did. And yes. what year was that? It was uh, 2002. So I opened in 2003. So obviously the process of getting started took several months prior to opening the doors. And so... Uh, the banking experience was in 2002, and then if you fast forward 2004-ish, we started. My husband joined me in the business. We started looking for um, a new banking relationship. We were going to open our second location, and we found the National Cooperative Bank, who I believe sponsors this radio show and supports all things co-op in in so many ways. And they were our second bank, and and currently uh, continue to be our our funding source. So Roberta McDonald from uh, Cabot Creamery, and most people know Cabot uh, Cheese, when she was on the show, she said that Chuck Snyder and the folks at the bank, NCB, are angels in the work that they, they do. They are. That they really get out in every aspect of life. Uh, they're making loans to folks that other banks wouldn't make to. So the, the one thing that I really love about NCB and Cabot, I mean, they really celebrate they celebrate such beauty in the communities that they serve. So it's not just about Cabot selling cheese. It's about telling the story of a farmer or celebrating uh, a volunteer somewhere in the country. You know, they created a volunteer app and you could go on and log your hours, but you might not have anything to do with Cabot cheese. Um, and they just did that because, you know, that's at the heart of their mission. And then at National Cooperative Bank, they give money to nonprofits. They support housing uh, co-op development uh, beyond just what a bank would do, you know, more as a partner, as a, a community, a community member, a partner. I don't know how to explain it, but I yeah. think you're doing well. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. There, Much more than just, you know, supporting a shareholder. OK, so you, you're getting into the capitalistic model versus the cooperative model the, the, the it's mission driven banking or in Ace Hardware and what you guys do. And we'll get into that a little bit is more mission driven. How can you help the community, the employees, the customers and these are local in the in the community? And so NCB is a national bank and they are helping people all over the U.S. and Alaska, just just all over Puerto Rico in looking at projects that are in the community and things that community needs. You looked around and said, this place is growing and there's no hardware store. So let's open up a hardware store. Great. Exactly. And I then, wanted to be able to walk out my front door and find the things I needed to fix my fixer upper. And I thought that, you know, the, the idea of a Main Street USA or a mom and pop business should not be lost in the city. And Logan Circle seems like the perfect place to make that happen. And so now you have 11. And it is interesting, your second year, you were doing your second store already. <laughs> Why? We were crazy. We, we didn't open the second store until the, well, it was two years to the day. So we did have a two-year gap between that first and second. And then after that, we opened... Um, pretty much one a year. I mean, one, because we had the support of NCB and their funding. And two, 
we had the strong support of neighborhoods all across Washington, D.C. and in Baltimore City uh, that were really just starving for, for retail outlets that were tangible and supportive and were able to provide the practical things that people in urban areas needed uh, because a lot of those businesses just didn't exist in the cities. Wow. Okay, so you get fired. <laughs> <laughs> I did. Why? Instead of looking around and saying, hey, we can't do anything or, you know, I don't know, suck on your paw or something and, and get some ice cream and sit around. <laughs> you started a hard work. <laughs> okay. I, well, I came, I had a lousy commute. And so I, the truth is I came home from work one day and I told my husband I wasn't going to commute anymore. And I wasn't going to work for a man. And this is, of course, no offense to men. I just, my boss at the time was a, a man. And it was a startup that had taken a lot of investor money and, and the money was gone. And so I had to tell the investors the money was gone. And so, you know, all of this in my brain was, well, I shouldn't drive and I shouldn't work for a man. Silly, of course, in hindsight. But, and my husband said, well, what are you going to do? And I said, something very practical. I'm not selling technology. I'm selling something we can hold on to. And mm -hmm. a lot of people don't know this, but every single hardware store in the country either buys from a co-op or a wholesaler. We are truly independent, but we have to get our products from somewhere. And so at the time, I know we, we reached out to True Value and Ace, the two biggest hardware co-ops in the country at the time, and Ace responded first, and then we went down the path of becoming a member of that co-op. And pretty sure at that time, I didn't understand what a co-op was either. Um, okay. So it's been a, a good educational lesson for me, too. Can you hold on for Gina? We're going to take our first break. Sure, uh, sure, sure. I got you coming home. I am not going to do the commute, and I'm not working for a man, and so I'm going to go get a manly job. <laughs> right. Okay. We'll be right, right back. Please don't touch that down. DC's News Talk, 1450 AM, WO at 95.9 FM. Information is power. Not quite. Information is not stored power. It's only when you put it into action that you get the power. That's where you get it. And this is what our guest, uh, Gina Schaefer, did. She went out and saw that there was a need and then went to co op. True Value and Ace are two purchasing co-ops that the hardware stores buy from. And every hardware store, I just learned something new today, Gina, either buys from a co-op or they buy from a wholesaler, all of the different products that they need. Okay, so you didn't know about co-ops, and I didn't know about them. I did not learn about them in school, and I have three degrees, a couple masters and a bachelor's degree. Nowhere did I hear about co-ops until I started nope. managing them. I'm a property manager, and I started managing them, and that's when I found about this wonderful model, and I love it. And let me just add this to you. I was with the National Association of Housing Co-ops, and in the Preservation and Development Committee I was in, and then the two older gentlemen there kept saying if we can get developers to build housing co-ops and people buy them. And eventually I said, they don't know about them. You got to get people to know about co-ops and they would demand them and then developers would buy them. And so that's what started this show was how to get the word out. How do we promote co-ops? And I found that to be my calling for life. OK, it's to let people know about co-ops all different forms, and I've learned about it. We've been on the air now for five and one-half years, Gina. That's awesome. And we were only going to do it for one month, okay? <laughs> so, wow. So what have you found out are, are the benefits of a co-op? It's allowed you, this co-op, to get 11 stores in 14 years? Did I add that up right? 2000? Uh, it's been 16 now, right? 16. Uh, okay. 2000, 2003 was when I opened the first one. So, yes. 11 stores yeah, and in, in 16 years. Wow. I think, well, I mean, I've learned a lot that you mentioned something funny before the break that I ended up in this sort of traditionally male world, which is still, uh, still pretty, it's a good generalization for sure. But not only did I not know about co-ops, I didn't know about hardware running a retail business. And so I don't want to say that I was super naive in hindsight, but I was. But I used the co-op structure to learn about business. And I think now 
running a hardware store is equivalent to running any other kind of business. I could open a daycare center or a, a clothing boutique or an auto parts store. I mean, the nuances are the same, right? I have to understand marketing and HR and training and PR and all of those things, finances. Uh, you have to understand those departments, if you will, to run any kind of business. The beauty of being a member of the co-op is that it offers me the tools to do that much more quickly than me just trying to figure it out on my own. So, for example, when I opened the first location, all of our locations actually have about 35,000 different SKUs. Different wait, 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 different 35,000. 35,000. So we are small, but we are mighty. We actually typically have more products in a small independent hardware store than a Home Depot or Lowe's. The model is just very different. So we sell a lot of little widgets, whatchamacallit, thingamabobs, uh, that you won't find in one of the big box stores because. Oh, well, I'm just sorry. Model, I'm sorry. You have to see how intelligent you've gotten. You got the whatchamacallit <laughs> and the thingamabobs. <laughs> okay, you got 35,000 of them. <laughs> okay. How many times have you walked into a hardware store and said, I need this thingamabob to fix my whatchamacallit? I mean, that, we hear that 20 times a day. Um, but. When you walk into uh, one of the big box stores, and there is a place for both in society, so this is not a, a, a put down. A, a put down. They are they sell what they can sell a lot of in bulk. It's very smart. They want to move in pallets of one kind of item, and then out. So you know it's a revolving door of one kind of item. We sell a lot of little individual things that are very hard to find. A lot of people might say that's not the smartest business model, but that's really what differentiates us. So I opened the door with 35,000 SKUs, didn't know about retail, didn't know about hardware, and had to figure out how all of these things work and why my neighbors, my community members would want them. And ACE, as a co-op, gave me the, the framework for those products. So they said, this is what a typical plumbing department has to have to be legitimate. This is what an electrical department has to have to be legitimate. So they gave me the layout for the store, which laid the foundation, and then helped me with the tools for training my associates with online training, coursework, et cetera, through how to set up my point of sale system, how to set up my financial system. Now, there's a lot more that I had to do on top of the basics that they gave me, but I would have never been able to do that if it weren't for the framework of the co-op. So the framework that co-op gave you was information about how to open a store first and what products to put in that store. And you mentioned HR, human resources. So is, how do you, like, do they help you with how you hire people and what, how do you set up, I don't know, their files of what's important to know. And then you said PR, public relations. They help you with all of this marketing, those 35,000, whatchamacallits? <laughs> Yeah, if you think about um, one of the best parts of being a member of the co-op, so I use the ACE name, for example. All of my stores are named after their neighborhood. So Logan Hardware, Tenley Town ACE Hardware, Old Tacoma um, ACE Hardware. I use the ACE name to be part of a larger brand so that a, a shared resource of marketing money advertises that brand for me. I couldn't have my own television commercials or my own radio ads. I've seen you on television. I, I, thank you. That's yeah. because that's because my that's stores good. pay into the national advertising fund that ACE operates on our behalf, and it's still very different from like a McDonald's or you know from the franchise model. ACE hardware members are capped at how much we have to pay into that fee, and it's based on our sales. It's a sliding scale, so much smaller stores may pay a lot less in that brand assessment than the stores that are selling you know two or three times as many products, and so it's very. Um, it's very fair across the board. If you own a franchise, you often have a fee for national branding that is uh, regardless fixed, of sales. Fixed, fixed, fixed. Okay. Fixed. You pay it whether you sell things or not, which can be very crippling if you're not selling as many products right. or as many services or, you know, whatever the, whatever the franchise is. Um, and again, not enough on, on a franchise, but it's a very different model for funding. And then at the end of the year, you know, co-ops dividend their profits back to their members. And so for me, it's kind of this, mom and pop business, I get a dividend at the end of the year from the co-op based on a percentage of my purchases from them. And I get that money in stock and cash. The stock you can't touch until you sell the business. So it's kind of a forced retirement fund for the owners. And the cash piece, I get to use 
um, for store improvements. I can use it however I want, but I've used it for store improvements. I've used it to help offset the cost of opening a new store, a, a small percentage of those costs because the cash piece is not that big. But it allows me to do some things every year that I might not have otherwise been able to do. All right. So one of the benefits of starting your business in a co-op, in this case, Ace Hardware, is that you have all of this sort of blueprint laid out for you uh, that would help you to get started. Uh, and with that blueprint, it makes it easier to go to the bank because yeah, you've got your business plan, you've got your marketing plan, you've got your inventory plan of what you need to get. You said your point of sale system, your computer system, uh, I ran a Cummins engine company dealer distributorship, if you will, dealer in Puerto Rico, and I didn't know anything, and they helped me to set all of that up. And the point of sale was the, probably the hardest part. This was right when computers were coming out. <laughs> so before the computers were coming out, before you had computers for your point of sale, they were all card stock. Yeah. So that for each one of those 35,000 units, that you would have a card, and it was sitting in a bin, and you would go look at that card, and every time you sell one, and you would write one gone, and then when you order it, you come and you put it on that card. So all of it was very manual, and I thought impossible. I, I ended up buying a, it was a computer system, but it was big. <laughs> it was, <laughs> which, you know, You're aging yourself, Vernon. Huh? Well, yeah, well, You're aging yourself. I'll be 72 this year. I'm proud of it. Okay. Uh, so I can get 35,000. I didn't have 35,000. I may have had 10,000 items, but that was so, so difficult to keep track Hard. of all of that stuff. And it's that's impossible. I don't know how you did it. It wasn't impossible, but it was <laughs> difficult. And I changed it over from the card system. I never used the cards. Well, we had it because when we bought the distributorship from another company, all of that came with it. But I put it into a computer system, and I was one of the first companies that had it. It was, boy, 1981? That was, yeah, just aging myself. Oh, okay. So I understand. That's all I'm trying to tell you. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> you get it. Then it's 35,000 products, each individually, selling from five cents to, I don't know, $50,000. Uh, you got to keep track of it. You yeah. have to keep track of it. Okay. Inventory is probably the hardest. We have a we have funny internal arguments whether HR or inventory have which department has the harder job. And I have a very small back office team, so inventory is one leader and HR is one leader. And so I get to watch them duke it out every week. And inventory, I wouldn't say inventory usually wins, but you know, without the inventory or the people, we can't run our business. And I don't know, it's a very funny ongoing chicken before the egg argument. And with the inventory, if you don't manage it well, you will lose your business. We'll take our second break. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks, and the program is Everything Cooperative. This program is brought to you by the National Cooperative Bank, and we've already talked about the great work that they do around the nation and in some ways around the world. And Gina Schaefer, who has 11 Ace Hardware stores around the DMV, and Ace is a purchasing co-op. And Gina came home one day and said, I'm not going to drive anymore, and I'm not working for a man, so I'm going to get into this manly business and she found that the co-op really helped her to get started with the knowledge of how to open up the business, what to put in the business, and how you manage this business. So, Gina, what I said I wanted to talk about is what are the other benefits have you found out about being in a co-op? What are, what are the other kinds of things you found out? And you didn't know about co-op before this. I did not. So I, I mentioned the support of being in the co-op itself with, it, you know, the programs and the products and, you know, what to stock and that sort of thing. I think for me personally, I have a broader network nationally. So I think a lot of times small business owners um, can feel isolated in their business because they're on, they might be on a main street with other small businesses. But as a member of a co-op, I have the opportunity to connect with people all over the country. So I can look for trends elsewhere. I can talk about products that are 
you know, maybe hot in the Midwest or in New York or California that might also be good in D.C. So I get a broader view, I think, of business nationally that has definitely helped me and it helped me in the city. And then I think just having a story to tell. It's amazing. I, I did mention this, but how many people don't know Ace is a co-op? And if I'm talking to a guest, a customer, and I, I mention that, their eyes light up. Like most people somehow get it or they get that it's different than non-co-op businesses like a franchise, for example, mm-hmm. even if they don't quite understand what it means. So being a member is, has given me an opportunity to tell that story. And, and I would say to some extent, use it to our advantage. Right. It is part of the branding if you can tell more people about what the co-op is and what it means. It is. Yes. And my employees are really proud too to say that they work for a co-op and to understand what ACE does nationally for the store owners or, and for them with growth opportunities and uh, telling, telling the story of how we get involved in the community because we're a co-op. I think I have a lot of teammates that, that like to brag about that relationship as well. Okay. You said employees, you said teammates, uh, partners. So this is, you're talking about the same people and they're all of these different. I am. Yeah. I usually call my employees, my teammates, but it's interchangeable. The folks that work with me. Okay. And the fifth principle of co-ops, there's seven principles of co-ops talks about training information. So do you do training for your employees? Yeah, we have a pretty extensive training system. I think, you know, we always wish it could be better, but we have a bit of an upper out mentality. And by that, I mean, you know, working in retail is very difficult. It's not always the most lucrative and living in cities are, is expensive. And so we like to provide as much training as possible with the hopes that if somebody can't move up within our organization, we can move them on to a better career. So we have 11 locations, which means about 22 managers, if you will, between manager and assistant manager level and then some back office folks. And fortunately for us, we've had very little turnover at that level. So it doesn't leave a lot of opportunity for growth unless we're opening new stores. But you may be a sales associate that has taken to, I have one young woman works for me, just always comes to mind. Who started out working in the plant department, didn't know anything about plants. And I definitely see her having a career in the future in some sort of agricultural, florist, greenhouse, I don't know. Um, because of the skills that she's learned working in the hardware store. Okay, so um, she came in knowing nothing about plants. That's the flowers nothing. and whatever and seeds and fertilizer yeah. or whatever. How do you grow yeah. this stuff? Uh, maybe Correct. some organic stuff put in there. How do you make it organic or not organic? So she knew nothing, Correct. and she's just been sort of somebody that's a sponge with knowledge around this. She just, she just took to it. I tell the new hires to find something in the store they're going to geek out about. So you might, Vernon, you might walk in and you might think the nuts and bolts department is the coolest department you've ever seen. And you're going to geek out about it. And I've, we've seen that happen over and over again in all the departments at the store. So Mary, for example, who I'm talking about, just happened to geek out in the plant department. But we've had folks go on to HVAC training. Folks go on to become teachers in some cases. Folks uh, go on to be contractors, you know, construction folks. There's a lot of different departments in the hardware business um, that give people opportunities to have a bigger, different career. Well, it sounds like you're a little crazy because most businesses want to keep their people because you train them and uh, you want to keep them and hoard them and make sure they stay there and take care of your customers. And you're saying, I want to see how they can grow and blossom and flourish. Yes. It makes me sad because, I mean, I'm the mom and the mom and pop, right? I don't have children of my own, but I have 240 employees. And so I want them all to succeed and do better. We've spent a lot of time over the last several years advocating on behalf of raising the minimum wage and a bunch of other programs. So I think at the heart of co-op is community building and community strengthening, even though I, I am a for-profit business. I mean, my, my plan is to make as much profit as possible. However, along the way of doing that, I can help create a bigger and better lifestyle, hopefully, um, for some of the folks who work with us and help us build that profit base. So, yeah, I want people to leave. I don't want them to stay in the city. And it's hard to live in Washington, D.C., working in a retail job for a long time, unless you have some other support systems. So to the extent that we can move people up, I think it's our responsibility. And if you can't help them move up in the business, you help them move up and out of the business. Correct. But moving up is the goal, making 
more money, more responsibility, feeling better about themselves and helping their community. Correct. Wow, it's so different from the capitalistic model of how can we take advantage of people and rip them off? I mean, I'm sorry. Um, just get, <laughs> how can I get subliminal more? message there? Huh? <laughs> subliminal, subliminal message. Well, you know, so there's a lot of talk of automation now, right? And this has happened throughout throughout history. My father worked on an assembly line for the Hoover factory, which continued to automate and, and reduce jobs before finally eventually moving overseas. And we see it happening in a micro way in the grocery store and pharmacy business when they're taking out the cashier jobs and putting in the automatic checkout machines. And one, I believe that as humans, we want to interact with our humans when we're shopping and, and transacting business. But if all of those jobs go away, where do people start? Where do people learn those, those basic skills? And, and so we've kind of made it our mission to not go in that direction. Now, there are people who will say we're crazy, right? We're not maximizing our profit. We're not putting enough to the bottom line, however, whatever you want to say, because we still have five cashiers or somebody driving a forklift. But I don't know. Maybe I don't know how to run a business. <laughs> well, Gina, you're doing something right. In 16 years, you have 11 stores, so I wouldn't sell you too short too quick. I mean, Thank I, you. I, in starting my small property management business, it stayed small, and I have not grown it like that. So I just, I admire you for whatever you're doing. Uh, I think I called you a cheerleader before. I see you cheerleading for co-ops, cheerleading for people, cheerleading for community, and doing what's right for people. So that's why I like co-ops too. Community building is what you said. You said the Ace Hardware stores help you to start the business and giving you the training of how to how do how do you stock the business? How you hire people? How you do PR? And then the co-op is about community building. Mm -hmm. I hear you helping your employees, but what do you do to help the community? And or the community? You got eleven communities you have stores in around the area. Yeah, all of all of them, right? So mm -hmm. we do we do so much fun stuff. I think this is probably one of the things that we're most proud of. <laughs> I often give speeches, and I I tell my audience to close their eyes. And imagine the main street where they grew up and imagine the vibrancy and the smiles and the shopkeepers. And then think about, you know, when I when I'm really fearful of online businesses killing my business, I think this is where I go. And I and I and I say, think about all of that being gone. Think about as consumers, the lack of opportunity to walk out your door and shop and know your neighboring merchants and to see your neighbor's kids working in their first job. And I mean, it sounds very I don't know, kumbaya, I don't know what they'll say, but it sounds very uh, utopian. But that's the kind of communities that I envision and mm -hmm. are trying to create. So in order to fight for people to still shop in local stores, we, have, we host community events. We have things like ladies' nights and garden parties. We host nonprofit uh, meet and greets. So folks who are working in nonprofits can come in and learn about our accounts and learn about how we can help them grow their nonprofits. We do some community events with Cabot Creamery. They send us cheese. We invite nonprofits to come in and interact with our customers. Um, we support auctions. We, we have something I call us the, the Girl Scouts of hardware stores, but we sell candy bars to give the proceeds to some of our charity partners, nonprofit partners. We do a lot of fun stuff. Dog adoption. Dog adoption? Yeah, we've, we've hosted probably 30 dog adoptions over the years and have had dozens and dozens of dogs and cats um, adopted through our, through our outreach efforts. Fun stuff. We had our first ladies night. We had, well, we have a couple ladies nights a year and we had the first one at one of the locations uh, this year was the first time this particular location had hosted it. And we had 750 RSVPs, which is, if you've been to any of my stores, they're fairly small. There's no way we could have fit 750 people in that store but to me, that meant that communities still wanted to be connected with their merchants. They still wanted to be connected with their neighbors. And it was a huge success. You, know, you can't get that. You can't evoke that feeling in some sort of online party or in some online shopping experience. Um, so it gives me hope, I think, that at least the hardware co-op model is going to keep me grounded in the community and keep the customers coming back. I've been in a couple of your stores and I could get, I could see 750 people in there all day. I mean, 10 people an hour maybe or something like that. 
Or were these all ladies or were these guys looking to meet ladies? I mean, <laughs> well, no, I just, that's a good question. Actually. Uh, I do have some stores. Or I don't, but I know of some stores that will do a, a single meet and greet like that. This was uh ladies night specifically. And we don't turn down any male RSVPs by any means. I mean, we are very much uh, open to anybody coming, but probably 95% of the attendees at any of our ladies nights are women. There's always some scared guy that walks in that doesn't know the ladies nights going on, (laughs) (laughs) which is always fun to watch, but no, it's almost all women. I was actually, I was on a trip and I emailed the market, our marketing manager, who's amazing. And I said, how many RCPs do we have? And she wrote back 750 people. And I said, it is a good thing I'm in Africa because I would have a fit in front of you right now. I thought we were going to fit that many people in the store. Turn off the RSVPs. Um, I think we had 567 show up that night. Wow. And so the ladies come out to learn how to, I don't know, do hardware stuff, to do stuff in their hands? Yeah. So we have, um, we bring our vendors in. So we had, you know, for example, I mentioned the nuts and bolts department earlier, the vendor who supplies us with our screws and nuts and bolts, um, sits in that department and he answers any kind of question about how do I hang this? How do I repair this? Which is super helpful, but we do that all over the store in a variety of departments and the ladies can come in or men can come in and learn how to fix things on their own and uh, save some money in the meantime, learn about some interesting vendors, things that we carry like in the housewares department, for example, kitchen gadgets that are just fun and useful that you probably have never seen or heard of. Um, It runs the gamut. Okay, I could use some of that if I were going to do the work. I don't. I don't know. I've got two. I, I used to do the work, and my hammer would always hit my fingers. Uh, okay, that is uh, a real concern. Yes, we're going to take our final break, Gina, and come back and talk some more about the benefits of being in a co-op. And I want to talk a little bit about the seven principles. And I really want to talk about once before you on the show, you were talking about the things that you were doing for the employees or what are the employees were getting out. I know you got this, get want them to grow, get up. I mean, really achieve and, and move on in life in the store or outside the store. But we want to talk, come back and talk a little bit more about those things. We'll be right back. Great. Washington, D.C.'s News Talk, 1450 AM, WOF at 95.9 FM. Welcome back, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks. The program is Everything Cooperative, and we have Ms. Gina Schaefer on the line with her. She and her husband, Mark, they have 11 Ace Hardware stores, and Ace is a co-op. It's a purchasing co-op, so they buy their products, a lot of their products from Ace. They will also buy other things from other people, uh, other vendors, but a lot of it comes from Ace. So the values and principles of a co-op, and in some ways, Gene, I can see these really working for you guys. I like the ethical values of honesty, openness, social responsibility, and caring for others. And every time I've talked to you, I hear you care for your employees, you care for your vendors, you care for the folks in the community, and you've talked about that a lot so far. You have anything? Hey, I'm glad that comes through. Yeah, yeah. The principles are volunteer and open membership. This is in ACE. So ACE has to, if volunteer and open, it doesn't make any difference about the people that come in, whether they are obviously male or female, or doesn't make any difference if they're white or black or any other race or social or political, religious. It just doesn't make any difference. It's open for everybody. Democratic member control. Uh, so do you do any work with Inside Ace or have you ever been on their board or helped them to make their yeah, policies? That's a, uh, that's a great question. Um, so we are governed by a board of about 11 board of directors and I served for nine years on that board. So I, uh, I think July I will officially have been off of that board for two years, um, but it's three three-year terms if you're chosen to run and if you're elected. And I had the absolute honor as, as a young retailer, really, um, of being on that board for nine years. Wow. So you yeah. really get a chance of meeting the other Ace Hardware folks around the world. Okay. Yes. Yeah, that was a, that was a huge benefit for me, um, getting to know members on a, a different level, interacting uh, with so many of our members at the trade shows that we have twice a year. It was a huge educational process for me, which was great. I really appreciated the opportunity. 
So then you have member, the third principle, member economic participation. So it, you have to pay something to get into ACE. And you've already talked about dividends or patronage funds you get back at the end of the year. So it's a two-way street. You pay something to get in. Yep. And I guess it's, it didn't stop you, so it couldn't have been a hindrance for you to get in. No, the, um, the, ACE, the membership agreement requires that you buy one share of stock. Uh, and that val- is valued at five thousand dollars, and so that's the that's the entry fee, if you will. So, I mean, we could have a whole other show on the costs and and tasks associated with opening up a brick and mortar hardware store, but the the cost of membership for ACE is five thousand dollars. Well, that's definitely not a hindrance. So that's cool. That's good. Yeah. Okay. Autonomy and independence. That each co-op has to own itself, control itself, and I assume ACE does within the laws of the land. Correct. Okay. And we've already talked and we about are not we are not beholden to any outside shareholders like you would think of in a in a traditional C Corp. We are we are beholden to the members of the co op who are the retailers. Okay. We keep and I and I'm keeping away from this conversation of comparing the capitalistic model, the shareholder model, com- completely shareholder model. The the, the co op is a shareholder model, but it's one member, one vote. So they make this Correct. Very democratic. Correct. Okay. And we talked about education, training, and information, which is huge. And then there's this cooperation among co-ops. So how does ACE and how do you find that you work with other co-ops, both other ACE owners and then other co-ops like housing co-ops or credit unions or how you do that? Sure. Well, I mean, as a member, I can exercise that principle as much or as little as I want. So I think that we are pretty active in in exercising it. So, for example, we do have a great relationship with Cabot Creamery. We share it. reciprocity uh-huh. um, by, you know, Cabot shipping me cheese and me bragging all the time about how good it is to my customers and whatever. It's a very it's a small example. Mm-hmm. Um, across the country, uh, ACE has two trade shows a year where we get together with other members. But beyond that, my local ACE group gets together once a month so we can share ideas. And we don't think of ourselves as competitors at all. We think of ourselves as sharing resources, being advocates for small business, talking about price changes, talking about competition. You know, what are we doing uh, to be as competitive as possible in our in our respective communities? And so we have a chance within the co-op to play a larger uh, role that way. And then you also mentioned earlier the CPA, the Community Purchasing Alliance, which is here in Washington. And the CPA started to aggregate services like trash and, and Xeroxing. But someone, a very smart friend of mine in the co-op world, said, why aren't these nonprofits buying their supplies from a co-op? And so that's how we were introduced. And so we have a an account system set up for nonprofits in the community where they can come in and buy products at a discount. So it gives us a chance to interact with that type of co-op as a supplier, but you know, it gives us more outreach to other nonprofits and it gives us more exposure in the community. So it's a, it works. It's a reciprocal relationship as well. So Gina, if there's any nonprofits out there listening to this, how how would they, who would they contact in your store and your chain of stores to get this, I guess discounts because they're... yeah yeah so probably the easiest um, the easiest email address to throw out is info i n f o at acehardwaredc dot com. Um, we have a fairly robust account system for all businesses, so you can be a for profit business and get an account with us. Uh, you'll go through an application process, and then we have some great technology tools that help you manage your purchasing. Property managers, for example, who mul- who manage multiple sites um, and have People on the road fixing multiple locations may find it easy to send uh, the person doing the repairs into the local hardware store versus driving across town or out of town to get to a big box for supplies. So uh, we have that set up, and then the nonprofit partners work the same way with a few more perks because of their nonprofit status. Okay. So I don't know if Community of Hope as a homeless shelter, I was on the board for 18 years, if they have it, but I'm going to go talk to them and I'm going to probably want to invite you and your husband to their major fundraising event this year, but it's it has grown uh, tremendously in the last 20 years. Um, it has, and I'm trying to think. I'm on the board of House of Ruth, and I feel like within the context of House of Ruth, I've heard of Community of Hope. So, yeah, I'd love to know more about them. 
Kelly Sweeney McShane is the executive director, and how I know is I helped to hire her. I was on the board when she came on. She worked for the House. She was executive director for House of Ruth, and then she went off and got her MBA, toured Europe for a year with her husband, and came back, and we hired her. And she was a godsend for us because she didn't need money, and we didn't have any. (laughs) (laughs) And she loves it. She's passionate about it. And she really helps a lot of people. And so it's, it's a great place. So yeah, okay. You all, you would like her and she would like you. Great, great people great. doing great things. And now this concern for community is the seventh principle. And we don't even have to talk about that because you're doing it all over the place, like yeah. being on the board of House of Ruth and working with other nonprofits and really getting into and, working with and on the board of you or your husband on the board of National Cooperative Bank. So, yes, girl, great stuff. So I guess my next question, and by the way, that was a compliment. You can say amen to that. Y'all do great work. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Thanks. Thank you. So what are some of the other kinds of things that you and ACE do for your employees? I know you got the training. Um, I know you got the, you want everybody to grow. Mm-hmm. Okay. So. And I would say, you know, across the board, there are about, well, now internationally, there are about 5,300 ACE stores, about 4,500 of them, I think, are here in the United States. And we have about 42% of those stores are multi-store owners, meaning that 48, 49% are single store operators. And I say that to say that you could talk to every single one of the owners and we would all be doing something different or tweaked a program for employees. It's all very uh, individualized. So ACE gives us the framework with some great uh, online training courses, um, how-to manuals, et cetera, training courses that they offer around the country and in Oak Brook where they're headquartered. And then beyond that, it's really up to the individual owner um, to set pay scale, to set internal training opportunity or training programs, and then any of the salaries, benefits, and perks. So they may give us some guidelines for some of that stuff, but it's up to each individual owner based on uh, what we want to do, how much money we're making, how much we can afford to do, et cetera, and so on. So we have a, a fairly robust package, I think, for retail. We pay about 85 to 90% of our employees' benefits, health care benefits. For the employees, we haven't been able to extend that to the families yet just because of our cool. occupancy costs and some of our other expenses. We have, like I said earlier, I've always advocated on raising the minimum wage. And so we are in three jurisdictions now, Baltimore, Old Town Alexandria, and Washington, D.C. And for those of you that don't know, Virginia is still a state that has a $7.25 minimum wage. Now, I would probably, should probably assume that most people working in Old Town Alexandria are not getting paid that minimum wage. Mm -hmm. But as the minimum wage went up in the district, we rose, we raised our pay scale across the jurisdictions. So... Um, we only have a minute to go. So uh, we have paid higher in that regard in order to help us be more competitive against some of the other folks in our neighborhood. All right. Yeah. Last word for everybody out there. What would you want to say? Well, thank you, first of all, for hosting me on the show and for doing what you're doing. I really want everyone to understand what co-ops are and um, get involved in a co-op in some way if you can. As a consumer, we can join the credit union or shop at REI or, or support purchasing co-ops like Ace Hardware. And it, it's just, I think we make communities stronger. Hopefully we'll continue to do so. And I hope that thank people you. just start to hear more about us. Thank you very much, Gina. Everybody out there, please have a wonderful week and live cooperatively. Thank you, Gina. Thanks, Vernon. Take care.